Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO of Anderson Ranch. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff, I want to welcome all you. We're thrilled to have you here. There are about 75 people are logged on online, so we want to make sure we welcome them, which reminds me, when we have Q&A at the end, please use a mic so they can hear you online. Uh, and we also have the students in the workshops. Uh, they're streaming into the workshops, and some of them are going to continue to work through the program. After the lecture today, Feel free to walk through any of the studios. It's an open studio campus. See the work that people have been doing all week. It's really inspiring uh, to see all the things that are happening on campus. So please accept my invitation after the lecture to hang around and wander around a little bit. There are free cookies and lemonade to lure you into staying. Um, want to thank the people who make this session, uh, these seminars possible, these lectures possible. Mel and Adam Lewis. Uh, supported the program this year in honor of Toby Lewis. I know she's friends with so many of you in the room. Yeah, she deserves a clap. <laughs> also want to thank our partners, Ulight Arts, uh, who do a residency with us in the winter. They help support this program. And individual underwriters include Rona and Jeff Citrin, Eleanor and Domenico Di Soleil, Reggie and Lee Smith, and Sherry and Joe Felson. So a quick thanks to them. Welcome, we're thrilled to have you here, Maisha. Douglas Fogel is our uh, curator in residence, <laughs> and he's going to lead our conversation today. So thank you both for being here. And Douglas, I'll pass over to you. Thank, thank you, Thank all Peter. of you for attending. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it clearly, it's been a long summer. So we're, um, uh, this is the last of our summer series. I wanted to thank Peter, uh, everybody here at Anderson Ranch. It's been an amazing sequence of talks. Everyone has been amazing with the artists. I've met so many people. I wanted to thank you guys all for your support and coming to the summer series. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited to get working on next summer already, so we're already starting that. Um, I, just to briefly talk about what we've done in the last four weeks, um, I'm really happy with having Meisha here because it's the final piece of the puzzle of uh, what I put together for the summer series, which is having an artist talk about all the different media that are represented by Anderson Ranch in terms of what's happening in the studios, from ceramics to photography, painting now, sculpture. Uh, Tony Lewis was here talking about drawing at the beginning of the summer series. Um, and to have Meisha here is both a pleasure and an honor for me. Um, Meisha, uh, by way of introduction, lives in Los Angeles, as I do. Um, and we met about a year and a half ago, maybe yeah. almost a year ago. Um, on a studio visit, kind of a bit of a blind date studio visit where a, a mutual friend said, you guys need to meet each other. And uh, my wife Hanukkah and I, who worked together, we went to see Meisha in her studio. And she had an amazing group of paintings in, on the wall of her studio. And we had the most incredible conversation. But I've had a few moments in my career where I've walked into someone's studio that I had never seen before and gone, aha. Uh -huh. And I really felt that with you. And the connection was there. The work was there. I thought it was just like, wow. I'm like seeing something really fresh and amazing. Um, Meisha was born, you were born in Los Angeles, correct? Yes. And um, she received her Bachelor of Science in 2002 from the University of California, San Diego, and then went on later uh, to do an MFA in painting at the California College of Arts in San Francisco in 2011. We'll talk a little bit about what that first part of her education was as we uh, speak here. But Meisha, um, you know, has had numerous exhibitions at galleries uh, across the world. I am excited to say that a major, yet I'm not able to say which New York institution has, as of this morning, acquired one of her paintings. So she'll be entering uh, one of the great uh, American collections in New York, uh, institutional collections this week. Um, she is represented by Pace Gallery in New York. Um, she is represented by Massimo de Carlo Gallery in Paris. Incorrect. Oh. Sorry, sorry, globally by Pace Gallery. And okay, we're going to redact my last statement. You have had exhibitions in Milan and other in Paris and other places, so we'll leave it at that. Um, her representatives from Pace are here. We're so happy to have them here with us last night and today. Um, I think I want to start by asking you a little bit. Um, I know you have many things to say about the work in your slides, but I want to. Think about the idea of abstraction, because when, when we first met, we started talking about abstraction. It became clear in talking to so many other artists whose work we've talked about together, 
who bring up the question of abstraction and they refuse this kind of binary between the world and you know the, the, the concrete world we live in and the abstract world that appears on people's canvases like yours. And I wonder if you could start maybe by telling us how you got to this place. Um, this is a, a, a fairly recent work, um, but maybe we could start there. What do you think? That's a really hard question to okay. start with, but okay. Well, we can start wherever you want. Um, so, first of all, the title of this painting, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Douglas. said some really nice things. I appreciate that. Um, the title of this painting is Solemnity in the Antechamber of Dread, and this is a new painting. Usually, I like to tell the story of how an individual painting came about, because every painting has a very rich story, and it gives you a sense of kind of the timeline of how I navigate the material and my own personhood and relationship to this two-dimensional thing. And this painting, it's a big painting. It's 88 by 99 inches. And I made this when I was going through a bit of a difficult time in my life. And something was difficult for me to process and handle. And I felt like maybe I could leave it to the painting to solve for me in a way. And I don't always treat my paintings that way, but I, I needed that from this painting. And I was reading a book about power at the time. And the writer was talking about how power is being able to remain solemn, essentially when you feel the walls closing in, when you feel the dread. She who can stay solemn and keep the dread at bay is the most powerful person in the room. And that really struck me, and I wanted to put that energy into this painting. And that's the story behind this painting. I'm not sure about the binary question. What, what was the, okay. We'll come back okay, to okay. it. <laughs> but looking at this work, um, just looking at the forms in the work, the lines in the work, I mean, if we could talk a little bit about how you developed as an artist and how you came to this type of, I mean, do you call it abstraction? I call it abstraction. Yeah. It comes from drawing, so if you were to see this painting up close, you would see a lot of the lines that are lined in paint. You can see that I've left some of them just as graphite lines. So I always start with a mechanical pencil, drawing on the surface. I don't make any sketches beforehand. It's always directly onto the surface of the canvas. And some of the lines form together and create a shape, but really it's all in service to the line. Um, so it's very drawing based, but I do think of them as paintings. They are absolutely abstraction. I wouldn't know what else, what else would you call it? I would call it abstraction, okay. but I think the, what we've talked about over the last year or so is uh, how you get to these forms and how you get to this palette and that it's not simply created out of nothing. And I wonder if you could talk about how you get to the shapes. Are they completely just uh, inspirational in terms of uh, freeform, or are you drawing on something from the world? The shapes, okay. Maybe it's important to say this at this point. For me, I do, I do endeavor to have a pr level of precision with my understanding of how I make the work. However, that knowledge really resides in my body. So I really try to keep the cerebral aspect of like naming it with language more to like 10% of the equation. So I can name how I make these, but so much of it is in the moment. And I really trust that the last 10 years that I've spent making these paintings, making mistakes, learning from the mistakes, it is a computation that's happening in the background all the time. And I don't endeavor to name it. It's always intuitive in the moment. And I really feel like I have two little brains in my hands. That's what it feels like when I'm painting. But did you start with figuration? I started with figuration. I became obsessed with figure drawing. So I took like three years of classes in figure drawing. And I really love solving the problem of the figure. So it's almost like 
I was thinking when you're in a figure drawing class, it has kind of this sports element. You know, everyone's kind of straddling their easel. They've got their equipment. The door shuts, robe goes down, you know, and it's go time. And I really loved that about figure drawing, that sense of urgency and having to get to the goal, whatever your individual goal as an artist would be. Um, so that paired with improving my skills over those three years really appealed to me. Do you want to move on with slides? Oh, yeah, sure. we, yeah, yeah. I'll let you do that. Okay. Tell us what we're looking at. So I personally really love it when artists show older work, especially something that doesn't look like what they're known for. So I made this painting 15 years ago, and I loved this painting, and I still love this painting. This is the first painting I made where I, I was just really impressed with myself. I was like, okay, this, this could be a Mesha Mohammedi painting, you know? And it is. It is a Mesha Mohammedi. It's not like, you know, hashtag Mesha Mohammedi painting, but, you know, technically it's a Mesha Mohammedi painting. So I like to show this painting because um, it really does speak to my figure drawing, my interest in figure drawing. And maybe what I'll do is tell you a little bit about my life at this point. So 15 years ago, okay, I was 27 years old. I was really trying to get away from this previous career. I was still working in that line of work as a day job and painting and drawing at night. And I, like I said, I was obsessed with figure drawing. I also had just become engaged to my husband who's sitting here. And I've always really wanted a family. I've always wanted children. So I was getting really excited about that potentially happening. I found a book in Japantown in San Francisco that was just chronicling children's bedrooms, Japanese children's bedrooms. And it's the cutest little book, has all these great images. And this was one little toy that was in the corner of one of those bedrooms. And I don't know, it just, it just made me really happy to paint that. And it's pretty big, it's 47 by 27 inches. Um, and that's how that painting came about. I do remember, Douglas, I'm remembering now that see the line in the back that divides the black area with the white area? In the book, that's actually a door. You can kind of see the panels of the door. I do remember at that point when I painted that line, making the choice not to totally render it and feeling like I was doing something really controversial. <laughs> so subversive. Yeah, but I mean, I guess, you know, then this led to further abstracting over time. So this, this then morphed slowly, and then where do we go from here? Then? Yeah, I for, I'm sorry, I forget that I'm in control of this. You are in control. Okay. Um, so this would be fast forwarding three years for my MFA show at CCA, and I'm gonna show a couple of paintings from that time because the processes I was starting at that time really have endured over the last 11 years. This painting is 71 by 61 inches, this is when I started making larger scale paintings and doing the habit behavior of painting up on the wall, moving it down to the ground, and really kind of moving all around the painting. You can see in the middle, Douglas, I don't know if you ever did this as a child, in the school bus, fogging up the window and then stamping the edge of your hand and then making like baby footprints. So <laughs> you can, yeah, I probably had my... <laughs> I didn't ride a school bus, but yes, okay. I did it in other windows. <laughs> In Chicago in the winter. Okay, yes. so, and then some of the, you know, you can see the finger swipe, so starting to really print on the surface with my hand. And this is the first time where I really threw away all my brushes. And um, I realized what was super important to me was the feeling of pushing up against, this is panel. So pushing up against that panel, the sensation of, you know, like kind of scratching on the surface and less about the imagery, even though, of course, those are two little baby feet, um, just really pushing up on the surface. And then the other thing I started that time that endured for a while was never painting on a completely white ground. So this is gesso that I mixed to be like this really kind of like beautiful gray-blue color. And all my grounds around that time were around were about this color. Um, and then Let's, oh yeah, sorry, okay. Hold on, I'm gonna go forward. This is another one from that time. 
a lot of fingerprints, and I still do this now. I wear gloves when I work, and just making paint, like little paintings almost on the edge of my hands and pressing onto the surface. Are you using brushes at all? I do now For to line the tiny lines, but any big shapes you see or kind of swipes of color, it's all a gloved hand. Or if you look closely, you can see like some kind of body presses from my hands. I'm gonna, okay, did you wanna say something? No, no, okay. go ahead. So this is something I always like to show as well. Um, around that time when I was in grad school, I was babysitting this child and they lived near UC San Francisco and there's a great medical library on that campus. And so when he was napping in the stroller, I would just kind of like walk through the stacks. You know, this is pre-smartphone, so I had nothing else to look at. Um, so <laughs> I found this book, which was really an extension of a research paper somebody had done analyzing how scientists had come upon some of the greatest discoveries. So, you know, these vaccines and different discoveries that have really helped us. And he was really analyzing how they intersect with luck. And his conclusion was that the people that came, the scientists that discovered the most exceptional outcomes were the ones whose behavior was always very, very idiosyncratically related to who they are. So they would operate in their laboratory in a way that was really atypical, but so connected to their bizarre behavior. And I, this always stuck with me because I think the message I got from this was, if I was gonna do something great, I had to really have kind of like a relentless self-awareness of my own bizarre behavior. And that would be the only way I might discover something for myself that was new. And I badly, I very badly wanted that. I wanted to have that sense of discovery. So he calls it Alta Mirage. You can see, see that at the bottom. Chance favors the individualized action. Fortuitous events occur when you behave in ways that are highly distinctive of you as a person. And I would say that would be like a perfect encapsulation of how I operate in my studio. It's a mission statement for how you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you want me to go on? Okay, so fast forward, we're back to present day. Um, this is a painting I showed with Massimo De Carlo in Paris, and this is called Divination Ski Ball. Douglas, do you want me to go into the stories? or? Yeah, I think people would like to hear some of them if you're willing to share. Okay, so this one, um, I will share that I made this painting when I was making a decision, a major decision in my life. And I had taken my children to mini golf. This is related, I promise. <laughs> and I was playing ski ball, which is my favorite game in the arcade. I hope everyone's familiar with ski ball. And I, I don't know if other people do this, but sometimes I make major wagers with myself internally based on stupid games. <laughs> so I thought, okay, if because you know the 10,000 point hole is the hardest one to get, and it's in the corner. It's not in the bullseye. And so I thought, okay, if I get that, then I'm, this outcome is gonna happen. Like, I, I got this fate under control. So I, you know, I was bowling and doing it, and I didn't get it. And then, um, actually, this is in the movie, so I feel like I shouldn't spoil it. Don't spoil it, but okay. did you, how many times did you roll the ball? Only uh, once? I, can't, I can't talk about it. Oh, uh, you can't talk about <laughs> Lena it. Lena will kill me. Um, but I will go back to this painting. So I just love this idea of like putting a major decision into the hands of something very silly. And I think I always love to live on that kind of edge on a daily basis. And the other thing to note about this painting is probably the color. So I, I always start my paintings with two fixed variables. One is the color. And I always pre-mix my entire palette. And, off, and you'll see some images later of where I'm pulling the color sources. But I don't like to fuss with mixing during the painting. Because when the painting starts, you know, you know it's like release the hounds. It's just go time. So the paint, the, I have all these paint pots. They're mixed. And then the other fixed variable is you know, the story or the feeling. And, 
the story doesn't endure through the painting. It's really just a trigger to go, like go time. Um, so yeah. And what, so what is the arc of like the beginning and end of a painting? Do you work on more than one at the same time? That's changing. So I used to only work on one at a time. And you know, it felt really sacred to just put all my energy into one object. But I've been able to develop a way to have three to five going at once. And then, oh. um, no, I was just going to ask you about, you mentioned the ground before and that you right. always prepare the ground, um, but also the flatness of the ground and how the mark hits. I mean, moving from figuration in which you were trying to simulate something on a flat surface mm -hmm. to this, did that completely blow your mind in terms of freedom of being able to... Uh, I did feel very free. Yeah, and then the relationship, I mean, do you always find it... Uh, is there a terror in front of the blank canvas? I mean, when you have that ground set up, or do you have a plan before you... Sort of I, approach it. I would say there's good terror. So it's like, it feels good. Productive anxiety. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would say, OK, I definitely do not plan. But what I will say is when the colors are in place and the feeling is in place, I do start to get kind of like a sense of what it's almost like a sense of what the painting wants to be. I mean, I don't want to pull it out of my own volition. I'm making it. But it definitely feels like the painting has to reach a certain endpoint. And it's just about me extracting that reality from the surface. So in that sense, there's no anxiety because it feels like the endpoint is fixed in an alternate reality. Yeah. And, but so there's no preparatory drawing, there's nothing. You were really there with the canvas, thinking it through as you're looking at the surface. Correct. Okay. Move on. And then there's that painting at Massimo de Carlo at their gallery in Paris, Piece Unique. So they only show one painting at a time. And it's this special glass that doesn't, it looks invisible. It's really cool. And a, a lot of people actually walk right into it, I found. <laughs> You only see it from the outside? Wait, what? Is that? it a vitrine? You only see it from the outside? You or? just can't. It doesn't look, the glass looks door. like air. Ah, OK. But there's a door, and you walk there's in. There's a door. Yeah, you okay. can, yeah there's yeah. a door. It looks open. You're right. Uh, so there's one of the color sources. That's a Better Homes and Garden cookbook from, I think, 1973. Yeah. and. I think my mother made that meal. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm, but I grew up then. So. I'm sorry about it's that. Okay. I'm still here. So I, I, I used to collect a lot of thrift store items. So something earlier on, you know, when you saw that first painting of the toys, I would just go on these expeditions and collect things. And it was just my way of d discovering myself in the world. And I start, had started collecting those cookbooks a long time ago because I love the colors. The colors are just so wonderful. And also, this, the narratives inside are so absurd. I mean, the soldiers, like, what? Um, <laughs> but also, what they're telling these women to do is really out of control. So like, if I were a woman at that time, and my job is to prepare this for my husband here, He's, <laughs> I mean, I would be spending three days getting that together. <laughs> and, you know, there's instructions on when to thaw the meat and, you know, ugh, thawed meat, gross. <laughs> so anyways, I was really fascinated by this and maybe because I had just been newly married, I was also sort of like, am I supposed to be doing this? Like, I, I don't know. So I collected those at that time um, and I, I, I hadn't looked at them for a while and then a few years ago I pulled them out and thought, let me simplify my life and just use these to come up with some combinations of color. And so it really grew from there. So you really, you really were just collecting them as curiosities? Yeah. Ah, okay. Not as explicitly as source material? No. But only later. Okay. Um, there's another painting that I just showed with Pace, and that measures 99 by 88. And this is another one where it had a pretty fun color source, which is the next slide. So my 
mother-in-law when I was going to do this show in Paris. She had lived in Paris for a lot of her life, and I asked her if she had collected any magazines or you know postcards from that time. So she gave me a few amazing magazines. And there's an ad, I'll just flip through, um, for, it's from 1980, it's men's skin stuff from Yves Saint Laurent. And I love the colors, especially because they do look very 1980s, but then you have these kind of fluorescents, which I really love. So I based the painting on the, or I pulled the colors from that painting. Um, so this also shows you what I do in prep, I don't do any preparation except I do make these kind of formula books that have become really, really fun for me. And on one side, I'll have the source material. On the other side, uh, my essentially formulas for how I mix those colors. Would you ever show these books in the future? I think I want to. Yeah. Because they're super fun. When anyone comes to my studio and they look at them, I can tell they're just, they just want to flip through the whole no, thing. No, I wanted to take them home with me and look yeah. at them <laughs> when we came over. So. Right. <laughs> so it's really fun. And I'm not precious about them. I always write really corny, corny things that I would never want anyone to see, cross things out, really poor penmanship. It's not really for the public, but <laughs> uh, it, that makes it kind of fun. And this is another painting that's pretty new. So I don't always pull from printed material. Every once in a while, I pull from something, an object in the real world. So anyone who can guess the object or the thing I pulled from wins a prize. It's a specific candy. Anyone? Neko, someone said okay, Neko so wafers. It's a good guess, close. but not right. Okay. Pez, that's also a good guess, but not right. What? Not close, Easter Adams. Okay, I'll just tell you it's Jordan Almonds. Jordan Almonds. Okay, sorry, I got really, got really into that. <laughs> so. And there'll be a ski, goal, ski ball contest later over in the studios. So, so those are the, ah, those are the almonds. My first guess was before I knew that it was like Easter, some sort of yeah, Easter. Yeah. It was a very Easter eggy palette, right? Do you want me to go back to the painting or we just move on? We can move on. Okay. This is from my solo show I had last year at Parrish Heinen Gallery in Los Angeles. This gives you more of a sense of how the paintings look installed in a space. And I think there were nine paintings in that show. And um, let's see, what, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing, I, a couple of things I'd still like to talk about is like how you got to that scale. Because oh, right. the large painting, which I don't remember the title of in the back, but I mean, these are taller than human scale. I mean, these right. are quite, you, these are portals that you can kind of walk into in a way if you stand in front of them. Right. I think so. The first paintings I showed from my grad school MFA show, those were 71 by 61. And of course, it's kind of about my body span. So if I, it up and I reached, you know, I can grab both edges of that painting. I can reach the top, but it still feels large. And then over time, you know, after I did a few of those, they felt small to me. And <laughs> I think that's, it's really that simple yeah. after I, you know. Because that's not so small. But it feels small. And then yeah. the other you thing needed is, more room. because I'm so connected to my body sensation when I make the work, I understand that feeling small next to the painting does, it definitely does something for me. I like to kind of approach the expanse of the surface. I like to feel like I'm drawing on my childhood wall, bedroom wall. Like it needs to feel uncontained by the edge. Which I find, I mean, when we first met and I had seen the work, <clears throat> at a group show in Blum and Poe Gallery, I hadn't really connected it to the body as much as we've talked about over the last year or so. Um, but what's interesting to me is you go back to Eve Klein's anthropometries, you go back to um, Gutai artists like Shiraga who painted by swinging over his canvases and using his feet. This, this whole legacy of that, but it, you've kind of hidden 
the performative quality because they're being made in the studio. But at the same time, they're all about that. I mean, they are about the measure of your body. And this is where I come back to abstraction in the world right. again. You know, I mean, it's, it's not that you're painting the world, but you're painting the world. You know, I mean, yeah. it's your world. It's your physical space. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't... I don't really know how to talk about that, but it's. I think you put it really you well. You don't have to. Okay, thanks. But I, mean, I just wanted to make an observation. Yeah. But um, and the other thing is, when we looked at the image from Maso Monte Carlo, I loved th that you put that in here because there's also something architectonic about the work. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of um, fantasy architectural space that you're not quite sure where you're entering. That's these worlds upon worlds, um, mise on a beam. But then you also have a graphic and visual lexicon within it. And maybe we could start talking about these different moves you have that really constitute almost like a vocabulary mm -hmm. and that you keep going back to in terms of certain shapes and forms and lines. Yeah, well, we can go to the next slide, which shows that painting um, more close up. So you can see that. I mean, I think the vocabulary, it really does come back to my hand. So. I do like this sensation that my hand kind of goes limp, and I think I manipulate that to affect how the line is sort of coming across on the surface. And really, it's almost—it's not chance. I mean, it's like almost like trained chance. When I come upon something that it just feels very delicious to me, then I'll replicate it. I'll duplicate it. And so I'm really practicing on the surface. And that feels really liberating, too. And if it's really terrible, I cover it. But I try to leave the mistakes up there as well. In a sense that if you feel like something happened, you leave that as an incident, as a record of your hand moving through the space, rather than erasing it and redoing yeah, it. Yeah, sometimes okay. I erase. But also, if, it, if it's not too obnoxious, I just leave it because, yeah. Can you describe some of these shapes that you use? Do you have l language yourself? I mean, I have really, to me, they're like creatures, I guess. But they're forms. And I have nicknames for different things that I do. So like you can see in the bottom, there's that black wedge and the red wedge. And then there's a trio of color in between where I've used a lot of Gamsol to really make, I don't know if you can tell in this image, but it makes the paint really kind of fan out like watercolor. And so I call those pinwheel splats in my head. But they all have like little goofy, goofy corny names. I just, I just had a little revelation when you talked about the red wedge and the, and the black wedge. And I go back to like Russian constructivism and think about how abstraction was used as a revolutionary kind of language about the world, but I mean, literally, there was a whole language about graphic forms and shapes and triangles smashing into, you know, Lizitsky's famous, like, what is it, the, the red wedge, you know, smashes the, the white, which was the white Russian uh, czarist kind of, you know, but all done graphically without any kind of, you know, depiction. And I mean, there just seems to be all these things happening in the painting as you move from one place to the next, whether they're creatures coming together to form something, moving apart. There's graphic forms kind of colliding, like plate tectonics or, mm -hmm. or glaciers kind of into each other. So there's so much happening, and yet nothing happening in terms of the world as we know it representationally. But I don't know. But uh, we could, you have a couple of close-ups oh, of yeah. some of so your... This is ah. actually a film still of me working on that painting. Mm -hmm. So. There's hundred, several hundreds of hours of footage of me working in the studio. I've been, Why? <laughs> I've been working with a filmmaker, <laughs> Lena Larson, who's been making, working on a feature-length documentary about me. And I begged her to let me use this image. So it's been interesting to know that there's all this documentation of me making this work. And I have not really seen any of it. But this gives you a sense of how I work. And this painting, and she has all this documented. This painting, I would pull off the wall, on, work on it on the ground, pull paint on the ground, pull it back up. But um, shit, there's another close-up of how I spread the paint. So that's that 
one of the red wedges and mixing like big pools of paint and just spreading it on the surface. And then the arc on the left, that's a graphite line, so. Just to demarcate the zone, your hands can go. Yeah. But you don't use tape, you don't use, no. The only problem is I'm getting better at replicating, so now I think it looks like I'm using <laughs> tape. So I have to deal with that. Uh, this is another painting from that show. And I can show you. Now, all of these often have very poetic or funny or titles. Oh, that, yeah. And we haven't really talked about that. And I don't want to disrupt your train of thought. But we're looking at images that also you have chosen not to say untitled. You have chosen titles for these things. Oh, I could never say untitled, ever. Why? Um, you know, actually, I was, I was inspired by that Mark Manders show. You know, you had the, all that text. Mark, I, I did an exhibition years ago at the Aspen Art Museum with Heidi Zuckerman Jac Jacobson of Mark Manders, and we did it in Los Angeles and here, and you saw the show in he, LA. Didn't he have a ton of text in each? He writes them himself. I was yeah. really inspired by that, because I actually didn't know you were allowed to do that. And As a curator, can I say, please write your own labels? Because <laughs> But I love the idea, especially with abstraction. I think abstraction can be a little cruel sometimes. And I always want my paintings to be generous. I mean cruel in the sense of inscrutable, withholding, hard to read? Yeah, withholding. And um, just, just a bad attitude a lot of the time. <laughs> but I always want my paintings to be generous. And I try to do that with my color and form and what you were talking about. like the architectural landscape inviting you in. Um, but I found that the titles, especially when the paintings weren't as good, I felt like the titles helped bridge that gap a little bit and helped me talk to people about the work. And I have a lot of fun with the titles. And um, yeah, so this one that I showed is called Head Up in the Clouds Like Zeus, which unfortunately is pulled from an Eminem song. But I sometimes pull lyrics from songs. <laughs> but yeah. Fair enough. And then this is a booth I did at Independent last year in New York with Parrish Heinen. And this is my favorite thing ever. I was paired with John Wesley, who's one of my very favorite artists ever. And this was a super special moment for me. So you can see his piece on the right, which is a series of sinking ships and then my piece on the left. Why is John one of your favorite artists? Because that's one of my questions I wanted to get to, is like, who do you look at? Who's inspired you? And I can, I can imagine why John Wesley might be, but I'm curious So I, you could tell us. I've never required, I've never had a huge appetite for looking at art. My original impulse for making art is because I have this pathological need to express myself. So I'm not the type of person that, you know, people ask me, like, who are you looking at? I don't look at anybody. However, every once in a while, there's an artist that really appeals to me. And John Wesley is one. He was recommended to me by Glenn Helfand, who I worked with at CCA. And he's like, you're going to love this artist. I just, your personality. And I love, he's so funny. I mean, he just recently passed away, sadly. Um, funny, wicked sense of humor, inappropriate. Uh, to me, the paintings really are abstract. They're not represent. I mean, they are representational, but they're figurative, but yet abstract, which is kind of why I thought maybe that right. would make a match for you. Yeah, like that first painting, and he was a part of my thesis. So my thesis was about looking and how a painting can elicit longer looking. Like, what would make a painting? want you to look at it for a long time? That, fast, that question really fascinates me. And I went to New York, and I went to his gallery, and I didn't know you could do this. I asked to look at his paintings. So I was positioned in this office you know, with some director right behind me. I'm here, and then they put like three Wesleys in front of me. And I just tried to look at them as long as I could. It was really awkward. But. Um, <laughs> It's like a blind date with John Wesley, but you have chaperones. <laughs> yeah, as a lady, like right behind me. So um, 
it's crazy. When you stare at one of those paintings for a long time, the lines really do kind of fizzle and fade. Like, they are not, the image you thought you were looking at is not an image anymore. And I was just completely gobsmacked by that. Like, what? <laughs> you know, this is a moving image, really, in a sense. It was always amazing to me that Wesley was is one of the, the Chinati Foundation kind of artists. When I first went to Marfa and saw it, mm -hmm. but of course, you know, they were also friends together, but there's a way that what you're describing, looking at his work, that makes it very clear. You could show that next to a steel uh, cube by Donald Judd or a Flavin work or something like that. But it always struck me when I was younger as a curator, like, what? Right. Like the record skipped a little bit yeah. when I first went down there, but that makes a lot of sense. So this is one more painting that was in that, oh, that's the close-up, or the painting that was on the left. And this is the source mm. color from that painting. My mother made that cake, too. <laughs> I'm sure I ate this cake. So, yeah. That pink is insane. I yeah. mean, it's really. And this is another painting that they showed. Um, there was only one Wesley piece, but they would swap out my painting. So this painting is called Bob Dylan's Got My Birthday because we share the same birthday. But he was born in 1941, and I was born in 1980. So when I went to the fair, I was so excited to show this, but everybody just wanted to know if we do indeed have the same birthday. So. You got them not to look at the painting and just to ask about it. was kind of cool. They were like, do you really have the same birthday as Bob Dylan? I made this painting because I, um, I was having a conversation with somebody I trust and expressing some things about myself and my evolution relating to my ego. And he brought up Bob Dylan. And he said, you know, Bob Dylan was a true artist. He he would just do what he believed in doing, even if nobody understood it at the time. And we just had this really great conversation, and I looked, I Googled him a little bit more just to learn more about his life. Of course, I love his music, but I didn't know very much about him, and then I was like, oh my god, we have the same birthday. And that was really cool. So I, I wanted to make this painting, the blue, it's a really beautiful dark blue that I pulled from a Heath ceramics plate. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Heath, but it's a, a Northern California staple, ceramic staple. And then the rest of the painting, I just wanted really kind of, since we're talking about birthdays, this kind of like newborn baby colors, like pastel, like me and Bob, were just, Bobby were just having this party, you know? birthday party together <laughs> several decades the paintings apart. keep on a change in. um and then every once in a while i have a an inspiration that is not sourced in the visual realm and i was inspired actually auditorily for this painting so this painting is called laura dern's voice and I was listening to a podcast where she was speaking, and God, her voice is really amazing. It's very raspy. It just has all these levels, of all these different tones, and she's just such a gorgeous woman. And I, it was the summer last summer, and I, I'm going to make a painting about an amazing LA woman that's that age. Like I just, that's what came out of me for that painting. Did you ever? Did she ever know that you made a painting? I'm, I've tried to get her to know. I don't know. Maybe. This is another painting that's recent. Um, it shows more of the forms, I think. Do you, find, do you find in the last two years things are morphing, changing, evolving? And if so, like, is there, has there been a break like, that we're, and you're thinking at all? Do you see a new direction? Is it really just slowly, gradually moving? Is I think it, just slowly, gradually. Yeah, okay. I, like I said, I really try not to think about it too much. Yeah, um, yeah I just let my body do it. Yeah. Did you wanna? Yeah, go ahead. I think now I have, I included maybe like five or six images of detail shots so you can see the line work. And then things like in the corner where you see the three circles, the blue, the red, and the yellow, those are all fingerprints. And then all of that was started with graphite. 
and then I lined it with paint. You did the drawing with graphite first, with the lines. Yeah, yeah with pencil. Yeah. Yeah, again, when you go to the micro and the macro in your work, you zoom in, and there's this whole world, mm -hmm. and a whole other painting, you zoom out, and you see something else. I know, it's, it's hard for me to see the professional documentation sometimes, because when I'm with it in person, there are so many worlds up close. Yeah. Then you can see in the middle, like there's a graphite line that I didn't complete with paint. Yeah. And oh, yeah, I see. So there's a lot of moments like that. I'll just go. So in the yeah. media line, you often have graphite listed? Yeah. Oh, no, actually, Never. I haven't. Never. So, oh, yeah, just curious. Okay. Um, and then these are these forms that I come up with that show up on different surfaces. I mean, there's something about the sort of negative, positive, and that the John Wesley thing you were talking mm -hmm. about with right. the figure is there and then goes away here. And then sometimes filling in, that's a pretty small form in the middle. I had to use brush, but then I didn't want to complete the form, so that's when I went in with the glove and just like swiped down kind of thing. Oh, it sounds like, oh, whoops. Yeah, so then there's this one. Are you ready for the last slide? Yeah, okay. last slide. And then Lena gave me one more film still. She's been all, basically all around the world with me now at this point, so that's when we went to Paris. And um, like I said, I haven't seen anything, and it's, it's really exciting. I can't wait. <laughs> Oh, very excited to see it. Although this film, it does look like a film still from like a 70s, like, <laughs> like avant-garde film. It's in from Paris. Paris. I know, it's Paris, but you're the black jacket. <laughs> um, Mesha, thank you. I want to open it up to the audience. If you guys have any questions for Mesha, we have microphones going around if you could wait because we're, um, we're broadcasting so everyone else can hear you. There's some there and then you're next, yes. Wait one sec, please, sorry. There's one here. Okay, thanks. Yes, uh, great presentation and, and wonderful art. Wondered if you see any connections between your work and the work of Julie Moretto? I really do love her work, and I would, I, let me think. The thing that feels most closely connected to me is the energy. So it's impossible to stand in front of one of her paintings and not feel completely like knocked down, you know, from energy. And I think even though there's a more, there's less direct signaling of motion in my mark, I feel like my paintings also give that. There's a question over here. Your process is so meditative. Do you meditate? I do. And is this an extension maybe of your meditation and your thoughts that kind of go through your mind? I think so. I listen to walking meditations mm -hmm. while I'm working. Mm -hmm. So I, I am in trance for a lot of it. You can really feel it. They're Thank beautiful. You. Thank Just beautiful. You. There another question back there? Somewhere? No? Oh, no, you were waving, sorry. You just, you just bought at the auction, but thank you for your, for your signal. Anybody else a question? Over here? Sorry, we only have one microphone right now. Thanks. That was a great presentation, by the way, but you mentioned something about shapes and some intention to some of these shapes that you use, and are you thinking that you when you get into it that you want to repeat some of these shapes and talk a little bit about these shapes. Thanks. The shapes, um, do you mean like the bigger shapes or the little shapes or any shape? Because I do feel like the little ones are much different for me conceptually than the larger ones. Maybe I'll go just go back to a bigger painting. So, um, For me, the bigger shapes are really, it's more about filling the ground. So I would say it's almost an evolution of those earlier paintings where I had the dark gray ground, and it's evolved over time to be more interesting. 
I would say the smaller shapes really are the more exciting marks that I'm making. So I try to keep the bigger shapes just really fluid and big, and um, they're less like script to me. And the littler shapes are more feel more like a language to me. And those those will be replicated more often. Is there another question over here? The microphone is where. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I'm over here. Sorry. <laughs> I okay. didn't see where you guys went. Okay. And then you over here. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask a question about your bachelor in cognitive science and if that plays any role um, in your art. And then also, just because I don't think I'll give the mic back, I also wanted to know if you think of like the art process as sort of like um, a form of like therapy because you said that you deal with a lot of things and you sort of make art that's based off of different things that are going on in your life. So, yeah. I've definitely come to a place where I can lean on the paintings to help myself, and that's been really cool. So there's a very, uh, there's a healthy, good relationship between us in that regard. And in response to your question about my education, I did major in cognitive science, and I worked as a neuroscientist in a laboratory setting for a little while before I took my art more seriously and I went to grad school. And there's no connection in regards to subject matter. You know, I'm not talking about the brain, but I guess the best way I can put it is this. If you imagine a fictional painter making a painting on a wall, and they make the entire painting on the wall, someone like you, Douglas, who's looked at so much work, you can probably tell there's a certain weight to the finished painting suggesting that it was created that way, even if there's nothing for, like formally showing more marks on the bottom, for example. I think when you look at enough work, you can kind of tell what perspective the artist brought to the painting. So let's say this same fictional artist then lays the painting on the ground. You can probably tell. Don't you think you can sometimes tell? I mean, this is like people are obsessed with what was the first Pollock painting that he made on the ground. There's a reason people are obsessed with that. So I feel that absolutely a painting can occupy that third dimension the way a sculpture can, just by virtue of the fact that it was created flat on the ground. So I would contextualize my neuroscience knowledge, understanding how the brain processes information as another dimension that I'm utilizing. It's bringing something that can be observed as surprising or broken, or like you're saying, you don't know what you're looking, you said something like that, it's confusing. To me, that's another dimension. There's a dimension of time that I think is probably underutilized by artists. How does a painting unfold over time? So to me, it just feels like another dimension that is helping compute what I might do next. And the question of time is interesting just to interject that when I look at your works, and especially the ones at quite a large scale, it does make me, I mean, the world we live in in which we look at images digitally and go very quickly, right. when you're in front of a painting, and a painting is physically engaged as yours was in the making of it, and then you are physically confronted with it, and it's of that scale, it does take time to properly look at it. And not that it's a burden, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's a journey you go through around the canvas and you look at, especially with your work, with the different incidents and things happening, the creatures you call, the different lexicon. So time is something we don't think of as connected to looking at a painting, let alone making, of course. But indeed, as much as cinema is a time-based medium painting, we need to rethink that. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Hi, um, I am really, I think you probably uh, answered some of this in the previous question. Um, the line is so lyrical and it is like another dimension. So it's just, yeah, I think they're really amazing. Thank you. Yeah, is there anything else you wanna say about the line? Um. Yeah, that's probably our bonus content that we have to record later. 
Douglas. <laughs> um, the unedited podcast. Yeah, I love the line. I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. It's just such a joy to let it fall out of my wrist, you know? I mean, the most, you know, it's the most basic definition of the human condition in terms of what we think of as artistic practice is whether it's your finger or a stick or a piece of graphite or charcoal, that gesture of just the hand with something in it going across the surface, whether it's the ground, canvas, paper, whatever, that is truly something that, and that we interpret that, that we both from the maker's part, you know, uh, and also the viewer's part, it's, you know, it is the artistic act. So in a way, when I look at your lines, and I think, and then, you know, you look at your lines, you think of like, I think of seismic things. I think mm. of, of cracks and great glaciers. I think of um, all sorts of things like that, but they're pathways, they're, neur I mean, don't want to get too much, but, no, you know, okay. they're neurological in a sense of, you know, pathways and whatnot, uh, which are, in the end, just transport lines for thought and ideas and emotions and, and visual kind of yeah. stimulations. I think maybe what I would say in response to that is if you think to a drawing of the figure, how one line can capture, you know, it has an emotional valence when you put it on the body, like the line of somebody's back or you know whatever, you feel such emotion if it's captured correctly. So I think I always brought that here and really believed that line and shape can capture emotion that way. We have time, I think, for one more question, and I see one over here. The microphone's coming, thanks. I'm curious what shows you have coming up in the next maybe five years and how do you feel about them? I mean, do they excite you or intimidate you? Or what's your approach? My next show that I'm a thousand percent focused on will be at Pace Gallery in New York in May of 2023. So we're like eight months out, nine months out. It's go time for that show. So uh, that's all I'm thinking about. And I'm very excited. I don't get scared about the paintings. Somebody just asked me this question earlier, and I said I'm more nervous about the clothes, <laughs> um, <laughs> the which is a huge problem. <laughs> but the paintings, I mean, I always, uh, and I was talking to someone earlier, I've always tried to protect my relationship with my paintings, so nothing or anyone can ever touch that or take that away from me. Even if I wasn't able to actually physically make the painting, I know I always have that relationship. So I'm never scared. I'm just excited. And I would just add that you're going to be in a really lovely group show in Belgium in oh, December. Yeah. Oh, my God. Douglas, sorry. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> he put me in a Meisha, show. I didn't talk about is, it. Uh, Hanukkah <laughs> and I have included Meisha in a group show around the legacy of Raoul de Kaiser, an amazing, um, uh, sorry, an amazing Belgian painter who kind of went between abstraction and uh, figuration in his work. And Meisha's one of, I believe, 13 artists we've invited kind of in the spirit of Raoul de Kaiser. And you've made you're making two beautiful new works for that project. So we are super excited. And um, and then we're all Sorry going to New York. Sorry for being totally no, it's ungrateful. A, I'm, teasing you. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I'm not being self-serving. I'm just teasing you. Because it's going to be amazing to see your work next to that of Amy Silmans and Rebecca Morse and, and Raoul de Kaiser and Luke Toymans and all these other people. So we're excited um, to have you there. And I think it's going to be a really wonderful publication. And a beautiful and catalog. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do a really beautiful catalog. So, mm -hmm. But I want to thank... Mesha Mohammadi for being with us and coming from Los Angeles. And thank you all. Thank you all for being so supportive of Anderson Ranch and the summer series. And I will see you next summer with a whole new group of artists, as hopefully as great as Mesha. So thank you so much. Yeah.